Just in case you missed it, it's the top five sports talkers of the day. Now, it's time for Dan Barrero's Top 5 at 5. Brought to you by Gutter Helmet of Minnesota. Never clean your gutters again. Learn more at GutterHelmetMN.com. Well, it doesn't really, from a sports standpoint, uh, the toy department doesn't get much more busy than right now, correct? Yes. Uh, Baseball hasn't resumed, at least not for us. Um, Training camp, football training camps, you know, close, but not here yet. Uh, Summer league, we're done. I think we didn't make the the playoffs, I don't think. Haven't we already been? I think we've already been eliminated. I think you're right. Um, Our margin of victories weren't very good. Like we, even though we right, were undefeated yes. for a while, we were like buried I, in the standings. Yeah, I didn't realize that was way. It was weighted that way, but apparently it uh, it is. So I think we're already out. So it's a busy. Are you gonna be able to fill it up? You think? I am with some help from Colin Cowherd and Eric Musselman. Ooh. Our, our guy Muss joined the herd today. USC basketball coach in the Big Ten. I can't remember. I think the Gophers go to USC and UCLA for the men this year. I know the women do. So Eric Musselman will not return to the barn until next season, probably at the earliest. That's unfortunate. Um, which then you guys can all write your stories about his dad's warm-ups, and we'll, we'll get all that out of the way. I'm done writing. Oh, I guess I was talking about Roycey. Oh, okay. Because well, he'll still be writing. Guys. Yeah, well, I, I associate you oh, two. Oh, okay. Right. Um, but Colin Cowherd today on the Plus, you could have heard it, asked him, about any impressions about the late, great Jerry West as a guy who obviously worked in the NBA Mm -hmm. as well. Eric Musselman had a couple of good anecdotes here, and I I thought you would enjoy them as well. Go ahead. Well, go ahead. I'll listen to them. He may have regaled us with one of them. That was, I think, the day you were out. Oh. But that's okay, because if it's the one I'm thinking about, it's so good, it's worth repeating. When you're around Jerry, to you... Um, what was the secret sauce with Jerry? What what made him so... I mean, he obviously had great experience, Eric. Yep. But what was it like to be around him and pick his brain? Well, he was so competitive. Uh, will to win was beyond belief. I, everybody in pro sports is pretty competitive, uh, but he took it to another level. Uh, in the draft room, he was the most competitive person. I remember uh, being a part of two drafts with him, uh, and the intensity in the draft room was incredible. <laughs> um, and then you look back at like his time in Memphis, which is when I uh, had the opportunity to work with him. Um, look at who he hired as a coach. It's Hubie Brown. And Hubie Brown had been out of coaching for, I think, 14 or 15 years. So he brought Hubie Brown out of retirement, basically, to coach. And then when Hubie retired, he brings Mike Fratello, who had been out of coaching for seven years. And the reason I thought that's so unique is Jerry West, really pro player, but he went out and got true coaches uh, that were not former players necessarily. Um, And I always thought that was really unique, but it's because he thought those two guys were the best coaches at that time for the organization. So um, his long-term vision, unbelievable. Um, But I do remember uh, the first time I talked to him, I was coaching the Warriors and there was a trade made. And all of a sudden, a couple days later, uh, the secretary for the Warriors said, hey, Jerry West is on the line. Um, I'm like, man, the logo, what, you know, so I pick up the phone and he goes, uh, hey, uh, so-and-so just got traded to you as a young coach. I just want you to know you'll never make it. You'll get fired. He'll get you fired. Click. <laughs> I'm like, oh, wow, I'm uh, 30-some years old, head coach in the NBA, and the logo just called me and told me the guy we <laughs> traded for is going to get me fired. <laughs> And I hadn't coached the game. So, wow. um, but he was pretty close to being right. <laughs> was that the same story? No. Who was the player? Is it ever established? I don't know. Not, not, not in that clip. That's juicy. That's a great, well, again, uh, you, if you want, you can call it a Biden moment. When we had Muss on, it wasn't Jerry West we were talking about in, 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 regarding this particular story. It was Bill Walton. Weren't you off that day? Yes, because that was right after the draft, too, the, the, right? The Bill Walton story was awfully good as well, and it was a story when he was still relative. He was younger, you know, in San Diego. Yeah. I don't remember if he was in college. I don't remember where, but he was in a gym. You know, it was like a pickup situation. And Walton comes in. This is obviously when he was still healthy enough to play. And the old we got next, and... Walton must wanted to continue to play, and Walton s- said some of the effect of "You're too, sh- you know, you're too short, you're out." <laughs> At which point, Musk claimed 
he grabbed his stuff, turned off all the lights, left and locked the door. Turned out Muss had the keys to the to the to the gym on this occasion, and somebody went and grabbed him on Walton's behalf, brought him back and said, Well, okay, I guess you're gonna you're gonna play, which I thought was pretty enjoyable as well. That's a nice flex. That's a really good flex. That's exactly right. Uh that is a great Jerry West story. God, I'm I'm I wonder if it, I gotta believe somebody's trying to figure out who was that player. I mean Muss will tell you off the record. He probably will. Yeah, yeah. I should I should text if him. You if you ask would, him. Yeah. And we could also look pretty easily. And maybe I'll do that during Bob Roster Newhart wise. or during the break. Yeah, yeah. Warriors trade, whatever right. Muss's first year was there. That guy's going to get you fired. <laughs> Tremendous. <laughs> and just so hangs good. up. Yeah. Didn't even, See didn't get a chance to talk about it. Just to let you know. See you later. Speaking of players that may or may not get coaches fired, did you see, Dan, Russell Westbrook yes. is on the move. Again. Russell Westbrook is on is, the move. Does Utah really want him, or is this a contract thing, or is this they're going to move him on to somebody else? I don't even know. Well, that's a great question because you haven't seen where it's gone. He's oh. Utah waves Westbrook. Oh, there's your answer. So the Clippers and, and Jazz agreed to a sign-and-trade deal involving Russell Westbrook, and he's expected to join the Nuggets, the Denver oh, Nuggets. I had heard they had some interest in him. The Clippers will receive your guy, Chris Dunn, who we didn't need. Oh, uh, that didn't work out very well. From the Jazz for Westbrook, a second-round pick That was the Jamal Murray year, right? We could have had yes. Jamal Murray. We took Chris Dunn. We couldn't have had Jalen Brown because Danny Ainge picked him the pick before. That's Remember, right. Jalen yeah, Brown right. was like the wild card that draft. That's, that's true. I'll never forget, right over here, driving home, listening to draft coverage, and everybody was flummoxed that Jalen Brown was going third. That yep. worked out pretty well, even though you know me. I'm not a huge Jalen Brown guy. He's also in the meat grinder because people could read his lips at Summer League telling <laughs> yes, someone, I don't think Brownie's Brownie, a pro. Yeah. Um, I'm sure Bayless spent 45 minutes probably. on it. Probably. Uh, but Russell Westbrook going to Ryan Saunders, Mike Malone, and the Denver Nuggets. That that in a way surprises me, but it, we, it, you know what it tells me that they think they need a little um, edge or urgency or something. They need a little something extra. Calvin Booth on Altitude TV on Tuesday said, "I think we need some help in the backcourt. We're going to try to continue to identify okay. and survey that market. We have a roster spot left. I think if we can add a high level guard, we will be happy with that." Well, where did Monte Morris end up signing? It wasn't back there, was it? Phoenix, wasn't it? Yeah, it's Phoenix. Right? Yeah. Phoenix, okay, exactly. Yeah, Monte Morris yeah. is in Phoenix. Right. So anyway, Russell Westbrook, one of those that the name is always going to generate a bunch of yes. interest. Former MVP. He's had a great career, but he's been moved quite a bit. Yeah, I've never been the biggest fan, but that's no. just me. Uh, British Open. Tiger did not do well. He's not lurking. So he birdied uh, the third hole? Yes. And then the awful wheels after fell that? Off. Yeah. yeah. Three putted a bunch of different times. And is in danger of missing his third major cut. Ooh. You know, there was a time where he never missed a cut ever. Right, right. Uh, now those days, unfortunately, for the Tiger Obos here, the Tiger Trackers here, are done. Something called Daniel Brown is your leader. He fired a 6-under 65. Shane Lowry and Justin Thomas in the mix. Lowry just a shot back. And JT, Justin Thomas, who I heard Kevin Gorg say yesterday on the power trip, JT is basically a mess. Well, he played pretty well today. Fired a 63. Scotty Scheffler's tied for 11th at one under. Trying to look at some other names of note. Xander Shoffley is at two under par. Justin Rose is at two under par. Tony Finau, who will be here next week for the 3M Open, fired an even par 71. That's your British Open lumpy? leaderboard. Well, it's Lumpy. Lumpy, I believe, watched it from either the Lafayette Club or Excelsior <laughs> Brewing, where at one point he did have a Lumpy's Lager. I don't think they have that anymore, but I can confirm it was a good, solid beer. Fan of BigDeck.com, want to put a grain in your hand with our National Cash Contest. Final keyword of the evening, I think, is grand. Go to KFAN.com and enter the keyword grand. Another in an endless array of Caitlin Clark controversies when we thought the whole thing was going to settle down. Well, not so much a nationwide controversy, but one that I think is worthy of a minute or two. And once again, leaves me utterly and completely bewildered about why it has to be so difficult to give credit where credit is due. Oh. The fan. So I think this was on ESPN uh, Sports Center last night. Um, is it Andrea Carter? Yes. Andrea Carter. How am I pronouncing the first name? What's correct? Andrea. Andrea Carter. Very fine. Uh, basketball analyst 
And she is asked to react to the story that last night in, I believe, Dallas, Texas, the Fever did lose 101-93 to to the Dallas Wings. This was the their final game before the month-long Olympic break. But Clark had a night. She scored 24 points on 10 for 19 from the floor. But more impressively, she passed for 17, I should say 19 assists. 19, which happens to be a WNBA record for assists in a single game. She scored or assisted on 66 points for the Fever That's the most in a game in WNBA history. Interestingly, surpassing a 65-point combo platter effort from Diana Taurasi on August 10th, 2016. I want you to listen to a bit of what Carter had to say in what was supposed to be the analysis of and celebration of an historic night for Caitlin Clark. Well, that's the beautiful thing about all these eyes that Caitlin Clark brings, right? I know there are so many Caitlin Clark fans for good reason. She broke a WNBA record in tonight's game with 19 assists to go along with 20 plus points. What Caitlin is doing is amazing, but there are so many other talented pieces around her, and that's the best part. When you watch Caitlin shine, what else do you get to see? Aaliyah Boston have 28 points, and then even on the opposite side, you start to fall in love with opponents as well, and those players like Arike Agumbawale and Odyssey Sims who had 24 points each, or Natasha Howard, who's a forward, who had eight assists, all the players for the Dallas Wings, even J.C. Sheldon, who's a rookie alongside Caitlin Clark, knocked down some big-time threes. So all these eyes on Caitlin puts all the eyes on the rest of the league that is filled with so much talent, and that's the best part. For Indy, any Indiana Fever game, you're seeing Caitlin, of course, in the talented Indiana team, but you're seeing everybody. This is the end. time in one show might be a record i don't know is this friday yeah six o'clock i don't know well i guess i think i do know but i'll pretend i don't know why this is all that difficult now you and i have been among those who have said part of our bewilderment regarding any resentment on clark is the lift all boats concept that even if she's getting an outsized amount of attention Um, given that she's in her first year in the league, playing on still not a very good team, although a vastly improved team over the one that uh, she, uh, from last year, the the reason that they had the number one overall pick, Indiana Fever. um, We've said uh, you, you should still be rooting for her because she is bringing more eyes to the game. But this is an occasion when... You're trying too hard, I believe, to placate the folks who bristle at the amount of attention she receives. I assume Cheryl Reeve included. And maybe she was maybe this this was for a Cheryl Reeve audience. I have no idea. But isn't this the day where you don't invoke the well, think of all the extra eyes she's putting on the game? Shouldn't a performance like that, albeit in a loss, but making history in the way she did? Shouldn't the whole conversation just be about what she is doing or what she did in this game? Is this the occasion we have to remind people? And I'm aware now she's a lot of things she hasn't done. You know, she she shattered the turnover record. There's a lot of things she still needs to work on. You don't have to go down that road where there's a lot of great players that have come before her. Last night should have simply been what it would have been about any other male player who in their rookie year... Scores 24 and dishes for 19 bleeping assists. About her. But you heard what it had to be about. And my guess is it's because she's feeling that same heat. Everybody else does it. Be careful how far you celebrate her. Remind people you're not just celebrating her. You're, you're, you're celebrating the fact that there's this player. She named about 10. That player, teammate, opponent, and the eyes are on those individuals because Clark's available. 
You don't need to equivocate. You don't need to qualify it last night. It should just be about, what the hell? 24-19 is pretty good. Well, how did she put that together? Let's take a, a look at some of the passes again. Or w- what is this leading to? Well, let's see. The Fever are going to make the playoffs. They've won, I think they've won 11 games this year. They only won 13 all of last year. And there's a lot. Isn't it like the second half of the season yet to go? So they're improving. And by the way, didn't they start like they, they started like 0 and 8 or something? Yeah. And they were awful. So since then, they've once they've gotten their sea legs under under them, they've been one of the have one of the better records in the league for God's sake. So I, I this one, by the way, I hadn't even seen. It was brought to my attention by another basketball source, and she couldn't believe it. She says, "What? Well, I don't understand. Uh, what?" Why do you why do you have to make this about other people? And I tried. I, I talked to her. I said, "Well, because there's that undercurrent still that gets very nervous that there's too much attention on her. And uh, of all the nights, though, wouldn't last night be the night where you go? We can just go 100 percent, Caitlin Clark, on this thing right. and analyze the kinds of passes. Has she evolved already as a passer in her short time in the league? What is she doing better at? What does she still need to work on? What was it last night that was it just people making shots? What, what, are they figuring out how to play with her? Because that's what the coach said after the game. That part of this is we're we're you know we're getting used to each other and and they're getting used to the fact that their eyes got to be up. And as it is, they're always open. There still were a few plays that weren't finished that 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 where you go well, that could have been another assist as well. Now somebody even said that she 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 for uh she ignored some open shots that might have given her team a better chance to win the game. I think the she did. Is to win the game. Yeah, there was one layup in particular yeah. where I thought she could have finished, but again, that's splitting well, hairs. Well, I would say that when I watch her, the biggest issue and a couple people have brought this up. And it's funny because I think it it sort of tracks with Anthony Edwards. I'd like to see her it, it, I feel like with her it's a three-pointer or a drive. Pull up jumper. Pull up from 15 feet. You create space, just pull up, right? Which is what we talked about with with Ant. And he's figured he's getting better at that. It's okay to take a two-pointer if it's a good shot. The tweener shot that once upon a time was considered an important part for any in any scorer's repertoire. And I, I would like to see her do that a little bit more often. Um, so you you heard, I mean I, and again, we'll be. I'll be accused. Well, there you go, Karen Caitlin Clark's water again, like she's walking on water. Well, no, it's like name me in all seriousness. In their first year in the league, any big name player who was a combination—I don't know what a good analogy would be on the male side—score um, and assist maker, playmaker, who had that kind of number in a rookie year. By the way, this yeah. isn't her seventh year. Right, it's her first year in the league, and it would be. Basically, about that, and it wouldn't be about. By the way, uh, the, the, they're they're playing the Nuggets. You did get a good chance to see a couple of great plays by George, <laughs> by by name it, Dan Issel from back in the Denver <laughs> days. It's like what? What are we? What are we smoking? There's no one else that has to play by these Caitlin Clark rules that no. have been established by people who are apparently the guardians of the WNBA game. Strange. It's mostly just about read the room about the conversation that's happening last night. None of it is about any of those players that no. she just mentioned. As good as they are and as important as they are and that they came before and everything, nobody's going, yeah, you know what was kind of fun, too, is I got to see some of the wings. <laughs> no. <laughs> Nobody is saying How many that. times did they, did they, when Michael Jordan, his rookie year, would go off, how many times was there... But I'll tell you what, man. Do you see? You never can forget what a good player Joe Dumars is. Right. You know, was anybody saying that? You tell me. I don't I, think it's so. Just, no, it's just bizarre. It's the. It's the. It's the. And I, I'm not making it up. You no, heard it, it happened. It happened. I, mean, I watched it's, it's, it. It's, it's, it's there. And the it's best just... part is the anchor after goes, no doubt about it. Yeah. Now let's look forward <laughs> yeah. to the playoffs. And they talk oh. about the fever. They're probably going to make the playoffs. And Carter says they're. She would have them winning a series if they make it because they are playing that well. Yeah. But yeah, it well, was... they're in third place in the in the East because there's only two teams with winning records in the East. Yeah, so I mean, their third is a little misleading in that they're below 500 for the season. I think they're are they 11? I think they're 11 and 13. I don't know off the top of my head. No, but like you said, they started terribly. Yeah, they started absolutely awful. Uh, let me see if I still have the. I think I still have the standings up. 
just for the record. Um, I got them. They're 11 and 15. 11 and 15, not 11 and 13. Yeah, and they're in third place in the um, in the Eastern Conference. Last year, uh, they they finished 13 and 27. So they're only two victories short of matching their total for the entire season. Is this is it still a 40 game season this year coming up? I believe so. Yeah, I believe so, but I don't know for sure. And this, so there's still what 14 games to play. That means so they're they're past halfway. I guess you could say in their in their uh, in their case. Um, all right, let's do this. Let's pause. News breaking earlier in the afternoon uh, during the show that Bob Newhart has died at the age of 94 years old. A uh, a comic genius, I think, uh, for those of us old enough to remember him in his formative years, and even for the youngsters in some more recent roles that maybe gave him kind of a um, a second life as a performer as well. He joined preparing to um, entertain a uh, the a Minneapolis comedy festival. He joined us a day or two before his performance, and we're going to play back that interview when we return here in the fan. During the break, uh, Garzi sent me a um, a tweet that includes a two minute video of Bob Newhart at the Dean Martin celebrity roast of his good friend Don Rickles back in 1974. It's classic. In fact, maybe maybe later we'll uh, we'll play that as well. It's a uh, Cla- one could say, when I say classic, I mean sort of classic, understated, deadpan Newhart, where nothing is shouted, nothing is screamed, but the material, does, the material itself does the, uh, the screaming, and it's uh, very effective. He joined us about five years ago in uh, preparation for appearing locally at the, at the Minneapolis Comedy Festival. When I found out he was coming, jumped at the opportunity to say, Garzi, can we get him? Uh, Garzi got that done, and given the sad news that broke earlier today that Mr. Newhart has died at the age of 94, we thought we would, uh, by request, really a couple people have even requested it, that we play that back now to get maybe a fuller, more vivid appreciation of his outstanding career. Turns out, I guess, you your relationship with Minneapolis in some ways goes back close to 60 years, because I'm told that when your uh, the, the 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 Grammy album, the the Grammy award winning album, Button Down Mine of Bob Newhart, took off, that one of the places you identified as had, having first gotten hot was Minneapolis. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, that's right. I was uh, I recorded it in um, I think it was the end of January in 1960, and um, and and then I didn't hear from Warner Brother Records, and so uh, you know my friends were coming up to me. And and they were saying like uh, you you were you made a record or something didn't you I said yeah but I haven't heard from them so I called up Warner Brothers and I said uh, I said hi I made an album for you a, a couple of months ago and uh, I haven't heard anything and they said it's it's going crazy in Minneapolis they said every uh, every <laughs> uh, pressing we make we ship automatically to Minneapolis. And I think it was Minneapolis. I, I'm pretty sure it was there, there, this, this one guy in a, in a record store when they used to exist. Sure. Um, he, he would, he uh, would, he had gotten burned on some other albums. And so he had one copy. So when he <laughs> sold the, the one copy, he'd close the store and he'd run down. <laughs> he'd go and buy a new one. Because he didn't want to get stuck again, you know. So. <laughs> well, and and is it also true that you found out? I thought I heard also you were playing in Minneapolis stand up at a time when you got word that you were going to uh, perform at the Grammys or be a part of the Grammys. Is that true as well? That's right. I was playing the club. Uh, uh, Freddie is called Freddie's. Uh, nice guy. Pete was the was the uh, the owner and manager, and uh, I was there. I guess I guess I was there for two weeks and. Uh, I got a call to appear in the 1960 Emmy Award show, with which is being being uh, hosted by Steve Allen and with and uh, you know and sure. all his his uh, ensemble uh, Tom, Tom Post and yep. Louis Nye and Don Knotts and uh, so I went to Pete and I said you know if you can let me out for three days so I can fly into Burbank and then 
uh, the event in Takedown at the end. He said, yeah, because they would probably help business, you know, even sure. though the business was good. And uh, so I, I flew into uh, into L.A., and uh, it was on NBC in Burbank, and uh, met Louis and I, met uh, Tom Post, and became uh, dear friends with Tom and uh, and Don Knotts. And uh, I, I was like, I was just wandering around with my mouth open. You know, I was like, oh, that, oh, that's Steve Allen. Wow, Don Knotts, oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> But I think I think that that appearance probably was the thing that that broke it a, a nationwide. And there was a, there was a, a, a DJ Howard Viken, who who and there was another guy I forget his name unfortunately, but uh, he died shortly after that of cancer. But they they were the two of them were uh, really pushing the album, and and they would public they would publicize the um, like the driving instructor will be on. At 7:30, mm. and again at 10:30, and the and the submarine commander will be on at 9:45. <laughs> it's outstanding. Well, it, you you know, as you as you've talked about this many times, what what fascinates me about how groundbreaking it was for you, you win album uh, and new artist of the year in the Grammys in at 61. And I look back to who you were competing against for album of the year, and it's Sinatra, it's Belafonte, it's Nat King Cole. That must have been wild in of itself. They didn't. They well, obviously I, didn't know what I, to do I, with you. And I heard, um, I heard uh, uh, the Beatles. I, I, I can't believe it, <laughs> but I heard maybe they uh, before they really exploded. And then Sinatra, yeah, uh, it'd be one of the Sinatras. And it, what's interesting, um, I had my daughter told me this because her husband, her ex husband, was in the music business and. Uh, my my first album went to number one on the Billboard chart, and right. then my second album went to number two. But then the first album went to number two, and the, and the second album went to number one, and and so they were like number one and number two uh, for uh, I think it was thirty weeks or something like that, uh, and that was beaten by uh, Guns N' Roses. They had. <laughs> Uh, they, <laughs> uh, they, 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 they had it for more weeks. They had the first and second album for more weeks, and uh, and I always said, well, yeah, at least they went to a friend, you know. So <laughs> you, know, you, you hate to lose lose a record like that. It's but, a lot easier that way. It's isn't kind it? of yeah. still in the family. You that's know? that's the beauty of it. Well, you you've in, here, of course. It's sky. The album is through the roof. Your career literally skyrockets from that point forward. And as you've said, you know, there, there's so many stories about comedians where, well, they worked in these, you know, these 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 quiet, uh, half full clubs for like 20 years, and they they were in the trenches forever. You were not in the trenches at all, which had to make it, I would assume, very gratifying, but at the same point, a little terrifying as well. Uh, uh, terrifying is a good word. <laughs> but you know, the, one of the first things you find out, yeah, you know, when you when you become a stand-up, is that you, you got to make it look like you know what you're doing. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you can't show any fear. Uh, it, it just it makes the audience nervous, and and you lose your audience. So, w with all the, uh, the the bravado I could muster, I'd walk out each night like I'd been doing it for 20 years. And so it, it, literally I had to learn stand-up from, uh, from the top, you know. Mm. And and, it, and it, it's tough, you know, because, uh, you know, so many of my friends, were, they, as you said, they, they, they worked in, in clubs for years. And then uh, they, would, they would say, you know, if, if I ever make it to the top, here's what I'm going to do. So... I, I didn't have that experience. I, it just all of a sudden, they were saying, "How many Ed Sullivan shows do you want to do?" You know, and and uh, it, it was it was tough. It was it was really tough to to learn from the top. You know, I can imagine absolutely. Bob Newhart, the comedy legend, is our guest on the fan. He will be at the Orpheum Theater this Friday, part of the Minneapolis Comedy Festival. As I was, um, well, I'm pretty familiar with your career. Uh, I followed it pretty closely, but I always want to brush up on a few things. And one of the things that struck me as I was going back through some stuff that you've said before, what if you'd been a better accountant, Bob? 
What what if you'd been a great accountant? I mean, imagine what you would have missed up out on, the rest of us might have missed out on. Have you ever thought about that? Well, I, if, for instance, if I had gone with Enron uh, <laughs> as, as an accountant, uh, they would still be in business. <laughs> I mean, the, the Treasury Department would have said, we can't make heads or, heads or tails out of this. <laughs> but leave them alone, you know. <laughs> and is, it, is the story true that for a while, before everything took off, and you're trying to figure out, you kind of had the hankering for wanting to go into comedy and seeing where it might go, but you weren't established, that you 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 considered going to work on the do line, which is a a dated reference that you and I know about, and we may have to explain it to some of the kids listening up in Canada. That you were actually thinking about uh, that kind of job. Is that true? Yes. Yeah, when I when I left accounting and um, I, I they were paying really a lot of money on the do line was a early early defense warning system. This is in Cold uh, War days, obviously, yes. And they, yeah, and uh, it was like, well, it was 59, 58, that, that, time, of, that time of year, and um, it was up in northern Canada, and, uh, you know, you, you lived in this with 12 other guys and, and, and completely isolated, but they paid a lot of money, so I thought, well, okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll, you know, I'll take, uh, I'll take two years out of my life, and uh, I'll go on the do line, <laughs> <laughs> and probably I would have probably gone insane. So, so th that would have ruined everything. Yeah, I was going to say I'm glad. Although you... some people claim that was insane before I got to the do line. So, <laughs> well, I'm glad you didn't make that trip. As it turns out, it was an interesting <laughs> little nugget. Um, you know, you were you. So I don't have to tell you uh, on on your on Bob Newhart show. Uh, the the comedy program that was so successful for so long, you had it was murderer's row uh, for a lot of people. Again, maybe the kids who don't remember it was what exactly. I mean. It was yeah. all in the family. Same night we're talking about all in the family. Mash, Mary Tyler Moore show, your program, and Carol Burnett. I mean, we start with I don't think that can be. How does that? How can that be topped, Bob? Well, I can't anymore because of uh, it, this is before cable. You know, True. Yeah, and, and you know, cable has now fragmented the, the audience. So uh, we used to get uh, like Super Bowl numbers. We'd get uh, forty-two shares, forty-five shares. I mean, it was it was uh, it was it was crazy, and, uh, and and it was great to be part of that that legacy. You know, it was uh, it, it was a, it was a great time, and and uh, I don't know if we'll ever see it again. I, maybe you know. Maybe Thursday nights with the Seinfeld, and, sure. Uh, you know, and and then the Cosby Show, and the they may have been close, but I I, I don't think you'll you'll ever you'll ever see those kind of numbers except uh, during the Super Bowl. Historic for sure. Uh, you know, the the as you again well know, all in the family could get fairly political and get into some very controversial issues. Mash speaks for itself. MTM in its own way was trying to make some points as well. Yeah. Uh, but what's interesting about your program, and I like the way so somebody described it as quietly or silently subversive. I <laughs> I, I hope you take that as a compliment because I I certainly believe that's true. That look at your it was a, a childless marriage was you and Suzanne Plachette, obviously. Yeah. Amazingly, you slept in the same bed. Oh my God! And it wasn't the cliche sort of nagging wife, dumb husband. And so I like to think that it's in its own way it, it was very, it was groundbreaking. Do you agree? And did you view it then? Were you conscious of that as you're doing the show? Yeah, and we and we did some um, really controversial shows. We did, uh, which I was all in favor of. Um, there was one show we uh, uh, it was the first gay show we we had the the uh, featuring a, a gay performer. Uh, it, it was the, Mr. Carlin and mm. Mr. Peterson, and, you know that group, right. Lord of Freebus and um, and uh, Rennie, and uh, um, it, 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 it was played. The character was played by Howard Hessman, ah, uh, who, who yes. then went on to uh, C, C, W. 
KRP, sure. <laughs> in Cincinnati, yeah. And uh, and th- so he was he was joining the group, and um, and he said, "Well, you know, uh, yeah, we have a, a problem in our relationship. Uh, you know, I I, I, I want to go on vacation to this certain." spot and but uh, but Tom doesn't want to mm. and, and of course Mr. Carlson <laughs> played by brilliantly by Jack Riley uh, he said well hold on, well, hold, on. <laughs> hold on what do you mean Tom <laughs> so they they formed a group and uh, uh, and uh, she, uh, I think I think Jack Riley, uh, Mr. Carlin said to Florida, uh, Freebus, um, she said, she's, uh, no, you don't understand, he's gay. And she said, uh, oh, well, I think that's nice. I think people should be gay. And he said, no, no, I, I don't mean, I mean gay. And and she said, oh, well, then maybe you know my nephew, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> and and of course they they wanted they wanted to kick him out and I took a stand and sure. said no no you know people are, are people and uh, uh, and and so we, yeah we made a statement I think we were one of the first mm. shows to ever make that that kind of a, a statement so, yeah yeah I was very I was very proud of of the writing the writing was wonderful and of course uh, a dream cast you know terrific. Uh, Susie and Tom Poston and uh, uh, Peter Bonner is and Marsha and, and and Bill Daly and it, it's uh, Bill passed away last year mm. and uh, so Peter and I are, are all that's left of the original and Jack Riley uh, Jack Riley passed away a you know years ago. the the another thing that strikes me about that show um, was this the the jokes were allowed to marinate. Um, there's the famous IQ test scene where you, oh I love that show it, it, it was one of the best and you 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 know you lay out what your IQ is and um, you ask Suzanne well uh, what's yours and she kind of hems and haws and you assume that means well you know honey I you know I had four more years of college than you and I <laughs> and, and and of course her answer is well mine actually is much higher uh, and she just gave the numbers the way she put it but it, it took time to get to the the quote unquote punchline, I don't think you get that time anymore, Bob. I don't think that it, it works that way any longer in in, in comedy well, Dan, and TV. You're very perceptive because that's you know I I, I did the uh, Big Bang Theory, and uh, today you couldn't take that kind of time to set up uh, the line that we were setting up. And, uh, it's it's it, the audience today is they, they want it faster. They just want it faster and. Uh, um, yeah, I love that show. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Cause I, I thought it was a, a, a brilliant piece of writing. I thought Susie was marvelous in it. And, yes. Uh, I remember because I remember the, I remember the punchline was uh, uh, that Susie Susie said to me, "Well, you you seem different since you found out your your IQ." And I said, "Honey, look." I said, "The perfect marriage is where the husband IQ is one more than the wife's." The next best marriage is where the wife and the husband have the same IQ, and the worst marriage is ours, <laughs> where where the husband is is is, is one twenty nine, and the, and the wife is uh, is one one fifty five, and I said that you know which is uh, happens to be a difference of uh, 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 and she says. Uh, Twenty-five. <laughs> <laughs> even even better. Bob Newhart is uh, our guest and the fan. I'm, I, I don't want to keep you too long. I want to try to get to a couple of other things. It's such a great opportunity sure. for us. Sure. The the you know your your stand up career and uh, you know the but the button down mind of Bob Newhart, an absolutely groundbreaking album, largely played to what became kind of one of your signatures, the the so called one sided conversation. It's actually there's the conversations going on. But the the only side we're hearing is you kind of responding to whoever's on the other end. It, it, it's I I mean it wasn't. There were other people who I think had done that before you, but weren't you kind of the first to turn it into 
you're the deadpan guy. You're understating everything, and that that's what kind of made it your signature and what made it so brilliant. How do you view it looking back? Uh, yeah, it was you know the the phone conversation. Um, it it's been a, 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 a comedic um, um, form for for a long time. Right. And I even I read and actually it took the, the the time to to listen to a thing called um, Cohen on the telephone, which was. An early, really early, early recording by Edison uh, of a of a stand-up uh, uh, guy, guy named Cohen, and um, then Shelley Bourbon, of course, did it. Right. Michael Lane did it, um, and th- there was a guy, George Jessel, uh, mm-hmm. who most people probably don't uh, don't remember. He was a, a radio personality, and uh, he he would end each show. He'd call his mother. And and he say uh, and say he had uh, Jack Benny and he had George Burns on the show and and he 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 called his mother and say yeah I had hi hi mom this is Georgie this is Georgie from the money <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he said yeah I had uh, I had Jack Benny and uh, George, George Burns well anyway his his star kind of faded a little bit and he wound up doing. Uh, eulogies at, at uh, people he didn't even know, but, there, he, but he would do like four or five eulogies. He'd go to diff- five, four or yeah. five different houses, and he had this standard, you know, uh, eulogy. Uh, and and he, and he would uh, so he, one day he, he did like four. This is his fifth one that day, and he says, uh, you know, their husband died. Yeah, he was a uh, at prime of life, he was ninety-four, I believe, <laughs> and uh, and and he was a, a wonderful father, a wonderful grandfather. I see everyone here crying because they they miss. Oh my God, I know this guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's pretty good. Well, you grew up, by the way. I what you you know people sometimes compare you to Jack Benny in terms of timing. Well, I think you've said. Um, in terms of, and that I'm sure you like the comparison, and that you guys both were very generous about letting other people get the punchline sometimes or have the big line, but that George Goebel was the guy who, for you, kind of convinced you that, you know, maybe you can, you don't have to necessarily get dressed up as a woman or walk out with your ankles, you know, you, you could you could just come out and sort of be yourself, and there might be a place for you, right? You didn't have to blacken your teeth. You know? <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, George, he just came out, and he and he just he started talking, and he was he, it was like yo, uh, I, my my wife Alice, uh, crazy Alice, and he just talked very calmly, and and people were hysterical. I mean, he, his show was a hit for like four or five years, and um, yeah, it was kind of oh oh oh, you can do that, mm. you know. Uh, uh, so yeah, George and uh, George, I knew George. He's a wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful human being and a, and a great, great comedian. And, uh, yeah, you've done your research, Dan. You really have. Well, I, like I said, I, we, I, I, we, 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 it was appointment TV for us. It really was. Uh, it certainly, and not just the show, but your, 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 your routines. You know, your, your, the ability. I don't know. I mean. I was thinking out loud. I know you were you're, incredibly. Dad, you're, st- you're stammering like I do. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I, 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 that's kind of myself. Yeah, it's, you know what it is. I think it's contagious. Is what it is. Uh, <laughs> we had your good friend Don Rickles on a number of years ago, and oh, I was yeah. thinking oh, about yeah. a little bit about that relationship. <laughs> and I'm wondering if, when you guys would go on vacation together, is there a way for you to capture what the hell that was like? I mean, it, was it as much fun as we want to believe <laughs> that it would be? Well, you know, it was they, they they used to call us the original odd couple. You know, cause we were total total. Uh, you know, Don grew up. Uh, he was playing the strip clubs, you know, and for years and years and years. And then they finally, he, I think Sinatra was really responsible for Don's all of a sudden burst on on the scene. And um, and and we were, but we enjoyed each other's company, and our wives were were good friends. You know, they they. 
it, uh, and and we we had the same kind of the same value system, you know. And we, uh, yeah, we we went on vacation, and uh, it, it was just it was just a lot of fun. I mean, I wish everybody had that that kind of relationship where you know the the, the, the four of us could go on vacation and we just have laughs and and uh, and, and we you know we went to. Southeast Asia. We went to uh, uh, the Caribbean. We went to Italy. That was our favorite. The mm. favorite was uh, was Venice. We love love Venice. Last one, I promise. I've kept you too long. You, right. You've won That's a million right. honors, uh, all, all very well deserved. You know them all. It, does there one? And I know for you, you've said personally what you're most proud of is you know uh, married for what I think fifty four years, uh, children. 56. 50, yeah, uh, and, and children, etc. But, I mean, does... Uh, I look at the list, I go, is it the Mark Twain Prize for American Humor, which I always thought was extremely uh, meaningful. Does one stand out for you? That would be... Uh, Mark Twain would be... would be one, the, the induction into the, the Television Hall of Fame. Mm. I mean, you're, you know, you're, you're joining the company of giants. I mean, you're, you know, you're talking about Johnny Carson and the uh, uh, Lucille Ball and uh, um, Jackie Gleason. You know, the, you're, that's really select company. I remember when I when I won the uh, that one when I was voted into the Television Hall of Fame. Um, it, it, that year it was um, John Chancellor, mm. um, Dick Clark, myself, uh, Phil Donahue. Alice, I'm trying to think of her name. Uh, and anyway, she she produced a, 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 a soap opera. Okay. And they and they honored posthumously. They honored uh, Jack Webb from Dragnet yeah. and um, Bill uh, uh, Todman. Uh, oh, of Goodson. of Goodson and Todman. Yeah, the uh, right, right. And, and so I had already been inducted, and uh, Jack Webb's daughters, and, and his, uh, I think it was Julie Andrews, is uh, not Julie Andrews, uh, Julie London. Julie London, yeah. What was and, and they, uh, they accepted it for him, and I thought to myself, well, you come a long way, baby, because when you were an accountant. I, I, you know, I'd come into the office like everybody else, and we would talk about Dragnet, and, uh, and I'm thinking, and here you are, you're, you're joining his company, you know, and uh, so, so that was very meaningful in, in terms of you, you come a long way, you know. June twenty eighth, that's this Friday, Orpheum Theater. Minneapolis uh, Comedy Festival dot com for tickets. I can't recommend. Uh, more that you uh, give it a shot and 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 we'll go and see uh, comedic immortality. It's been an absolute oh. pleasure to chat with you, Bob. <laughs> Thanks so much Thank for the Dan. extended time. Safe travels into Minneapolis and best of luck. Thank you very much. Every once in a while, Guardsy, I am reminded how lucky I am to do this job and to have the opportunity, even one opportunity, to to spend thirty minutes with individuals like uh, the man we just listened to, Bob Newhart. Man, it's it's um. It's a good reminder, and I had forgotten a lot about what we talked about. I knew it. I thought it went well, and I, I enjoyed it, but, man, it, it was terrific to go down memory lane, even if today it's for all the wrong reasons. News breaking earlier today that Mr. Newhart has uh, passed away at the age of 94 years old. Quick pause. Top of the hour break. Back in just a minute here in the fan. A couple texts uh, reacting to our replay of our five-year-old interview with Bob Newhart. Newhart's humility was astonishing. He was a TV god back when TV was God. Millions of viewers shaped their schedules around his shows. Well, he reminded us of the kind of numbers they got back then, Super Bowl-like numbers, in part because that was a, well, that line, that CBS lineup I laid out was ridiculous. But beyond that, fewer options, right? So it's, it's the combination of good programming, leading to popularity, and you don't have that many other places to go, right? Now, as he points out, uh, uh, or he pointed out in that interview, you got a million places to go 
as uh, well. Um, Dan missed that when it was first recorded with Bob. Exceptional one half hour. And, you know, look, we, there were times, in fact, we talked about it at the time because we taped it, as I recall it, even then yep. before the show that, you know, he was struggling a little bit. But as you reminded me, he would have been 89 years old then. Correct? Yeah, exactly right. So I think, you know, um, hey, uh, he's not running for president. He's a comedian. You know, uh, it's a com- it's, it's a completely do- different sort of situation and uh, still a lot of what he said was kind of the classic Newhart understatement, which is what made him so successful. Um, a couple other texts that came in a little bit earlier. This is from former Burl Oaks chef guy, Bob Newhart. What can be said? Dan, I'm 63, been a fan of his stylings for decades. Of course, one of the best series finales of all time was the dream sequence with Suzanne Plachette. And I'm sure as a capper, he counted, he added countless new younger fans with his understated perfection appearances on a TBBT as Professor Proton. I have three frames sketches, three frame sketches on my walls here in Rogers. First of George Carlin, then Robin Williams. Last year, I added Steve Martin. Perhaps it is time to add a fourth to my comedy wall. That's a nice wall of comedy right there. And what I like about it is there's great variety in the kind of comedy uh, that each of them did, right? I mean, they each had uh, their own, I think, fairly unique place, very, very different styles of comedy as well. Uh, so yeah, I, I absolutely think you can you can put Newhart on that list. You put him on that wall, and nobody should be offended, or nobody would be offended because he absolutely belongs. The idea, like I said, that he <laughs> how about the he was he had the record for how long he was in first and second place until Guns and Roses <laughs> supplanted him. <laughs> it went how to good, a friend. It went to a friend. How good was That's that? That's the best. It was unbelievable. Uh, how good that was. Um. Call back to the Duns as a society that we had earlier that were uh, political in nature. By the way, was Nikki Van Exel the player that West Jerry West warned then Golden State Warriors coach Eric Musselman that he was going he'd cost him his career? Not according to basketball historian and a guy who had some time. One of us Hollywood actor guy Josh Brod. Oh, okay. Who, He's done some research? He did he some knew? research, and I haven't vetted it, but I trust Josh completely. August 2nd, 2005, which I think would have been right before he started, they traded Bobby Jackson and Greg Ostertag to the Memphis Grizzlies for Bonzi Wells. Ooh. I think it would have been Bonzi so Wells. So Bonzi Wells might have been the, the, the coach killer. Yes. Interesting. Because he was a high draft pick, he had, was, yeah. if I remember and correctly. He, he, he had talent. Yes. But he also could be a little bit on the, uh, fair to say, he could be a little bit on the volatile side as was well. Because Nick, Nick Van Exel, wouldn't, I thought it was a young player that he said, or maybe he just said he was a young coach, but Nick Van Exel had been in the league for a minute at that point. Yeah, you're probably right. I mean, probably. He was on the Final Four team that came here in 92, Cincinnati. Correct. Your Final Four. Um, I I once wrote a column clamoring for the Wolves to get Nicky Van Exel. He was a good player. He was a good player. He also kind of was a wild card. But that those were the desperate days where you're sitting there, the team's terrible, and you just try to come up with names of of interesting, you know, players with some some dynamism to them that you go, yeah, a little dangerous, but God, you got to get some voltage in here. That uh, that kind of thing. Um, but I don't think it ever worked out uh, that I recall who was the player it wasn't somehow he he must have read it because somebody brought to my attention that he noticed it and kind of liked it because he was looking for a, a place to land but there was a player who during a break in the action he was about to inbound the ball near where back in the day the Ingstein wretches sat right at at, at, at press row and there was a player on an opposing team who looked at us. It was me. I could have been Ashburner. might have been Sid. I don't remember. And said something to the effect of, I can play. Like, 
Hey, you guys need a little help? I could help you. I, you know, I, I think it was, remember Sedale Threet? Yeah. I think it might have been Sedale Threet, who was kind a of a or vagabond. Yeah. But, and um, <laughs> it's like, okay, well, it's it's interesting. And it, it, I mean, I don't have a lot of influence, Sedale, over, because uh, I, I never got Nikki Van Exel here. No. And I sure tried, but um, where's the... Uh, Trying to find somebody who's unhappy with me about uh, one of the uh, Dunaz rants regarding my frustration. Well, I'm I'm going too fast. And unfortunately, today, you know, you're supposed to favorite things. There's some some um, text they don't allow you to favorite for some reason. I don't know what why that is exactly, but that has happened uh, on a couple occasions, and it's actually. Yeah, several occasions. It's very strange what's going on here. In any case, he he was uh, he said, "Look, um, yeah, there's some grandstanding by the Republican senators who confronted the um, security. Uh, uh, what's the name of the, uh, the service that protects the president? Secret, Secret service. service. Secret Service Director. But this wasn't a trifling offense. This is." what looks to be like dereliction of duty and just by pure luck that the, uh, that a former president trying to be a president again does not get murdered, does not get assassinated. And I don't disagree with the fact that there's a lot at stake there. I just don't buy that you're looking for answers there, that, that the whole point of that is anything but, as we said earlier, performance. And a couple people online were similarly disappointed and assumed that that was my way as DFL Dan of letting her and several others off the hook. There's nothing that is suggested in our coverage of this story that indicates a, a reticence to hold the proper individuals accountable. We've been asking questions virtually from the beginning. We have uh, openly uh, mocked the quote from her. We had Gerald Posner on, was it yesterday or the day before, in which we linked to his column asking a number of questions about how badly the security uh, ran on that that day, how much the degree to which it failed. But, again, we can do two things at the same time. We could say she's in trouble and say that's a performative way that has nothing to do with trying to hold people accountable at all. It's just, it's, it should be obvious, but unfortunately it's not. We're late, aren't we? Let me break. We'll come back, wrap up the show next. Show wrap brought to you by American Pressure, commercial grade pressure washers since 1975. It's the bumper to bumper show wrap. Andy from Forgotten Star Brewing texted earlier, Rube party is tomorrow night there. Tell Dan we've got three, I think he might have heard my tater tot comment. Tell Dan we have three food trucks tomorrow, including our own with great fries, sweet potato fries, and our sweet corn smash burger. That's Andy. Oh, my gosh. That sounds pretty good. That sounds outstanding. Star Brewing. Um, The festivities begin, did you say at 5? 5 o'clock, doors open. 5 o'clock. Now, we're doing the show from here. So we'll be heading there. Well, I will be. I'm sure you've got an excuse to not show up because you do that every year. Um, I'll be showing up, I assume, after. Excuse me? Am I wrong? Are you going to be there this year? I'm going to be there. Yes, I will be there. Uh, Dan, Bob Newhart was a huge hit in the Twin Cities in the early 60s, thanks to Boone and Erickson and Jurgen Nash just saying. Uh, We we did the local angle early in the interview uh, with Newhart that Minneapolis was like the first place where his what turned out to be his, his best-selling number one album, um, succeeded. I He didn't name those individuals. He named a couple record stores. But um, I'll take him at his word. But we, we I guess, rightly in this case, can, can uh, celebrate great prescience there, a great understanding of true comic comedy genius. We saw it correct? clearly. Yeah, we well, saw it Well, he's from Chicago. He had Midwest sensibilities, Midwest sensibilities like us. That's true. We understood. We understand each other. It makes total sense. And he said, he in the interview, we talked about him being an accountant, a failed accountant. A couple of stories said he also went to law school, which we didn't talk about. Yep, he was both. Uh, and I guess it was both. Yeah, he, yeah, he, he flunked, flunked out. out of law school, and then he became an accountant. And then he, how about that? He was going to work for the Do Line, which was basically 
the the line of defense, like we all thought the commies were coming. He was going to work in one of those 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 like outpost buildings. Think about it, Bob Newhart. Can't make it up. Uh, tomorrow is Friday. Lavelle E. Neal III from Cooperstown, New York. As we prepare for the Joe Maurer Hall of Fame induction. He's flying out tomorrow morning, so hopefully uh, he remembers his wallet. We ain't going to get him then. Well, we might. Delayed. It might be from MSP. Yeah. <laughs> that's Like a month ago. That's a very, very good point. Um, thank you for watching or listening today. And um, we'll start all over again at 3 o'clock right here on The Fan. I'll be there. Thank you for the memories. Thank you for the great time. We love you, Dan. Thank- for your kindness, thank you for your vision, for your spirituality, for healing me. Mostly, though, Dan, thank you for my life.